Good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? Amazing. Anything other than amazing? Okay. Good works. Good works. All right, we are going to talk about the Ten Commandments today. I want you guys to raise your hands, and anyone in the congregation, we're going to put you on the spot, if you can name all the Ten Commandments without looking in the Bible. Raise your hand if you can confidently name all the Ten Commandments. Pastor Jim, you have some work to do today. (laughs) All right, we're going to talk about the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments, they're kind of like rules. They're rules that God has given us to live by, and he wants us to obey those rules. So something that we can think about as we learn this morning is that we have ten fingers. We also have ten toes. So I think maybe when he was creating us that he might have helped us to say, hey, I have a digit for each rule that I need to try to remember to obey. So we're going to look up at the screen behind us, and there are a couple pictures that I'm going to have you guys look at, and that's going to help us to explain our Ten Commandments. So we're going to look at the first one, and that's just a picture of the tablets that the Ten Commandments are written on. Those were the rules that Jesus had everyone follow. The second one is a picture, and it has a movie star on there. There's the words power. And basically what this is saying is that we need to put God first. Sometimes we don't like to do that. We like to take our concerns and things that we feel are more important and put them ahead of God. The second one, we see a little boy, and he's playing video games. How many of us do that? Do any of us play video games? Do you maybe have a hobby that you really enjoy doing? Yeah? Do you sometimes do it for long periods of time? Maybe binge-watching on the computer or TV, any shows? Yeah? All right. Well, he doesn't want us to have anyone before him. He wants us to worship him only. So sometimes when we're doing those things, we are creating what's called an idol, and we are spending more time with that than we are with God, and that makes him sad. The third picture is a woman, and she's in her car, and she's raising her fist. She is not very happy. And with this one, we want to remember to use God's name with respect. Sometimes when we're out on the road or something happens to us, we get angry, and we use God's name as a bad word as opposed to a good word. And as you get older, you'll understand what she's going through right now is called road rage. So you need to really make sure that when you get angry that you have to dispel all of that negative energy and not say God's name in a bad word. The fourth picture is a picture of the church. And with this one, what we need to do is remember the Sabbath day, which is God's day. If you can think back to in the Bible how on the seventh day he rested, that's what he wants us to do too. And during that time, he wants us to worship him. Our next picture is a picture of our mom and dad. And that is just basically to, once again, remind us to respect our parents, to listen to our mom and dads. They know what they're talking about when they are trying to help us as we grow up and go through life. And so we need to listen to what they have to say. We also have another picture, and it's a little bit more morbid, but there's a tombstone and there's a gun. And most of the time, those don't mean good things. And basically what this rule is saying is you should not hurt other people. You have no right to take anyone else's life. You shouldn't be trying to harm them in any way. God doesn't want us to bring harm to ourselves or to anybody else. Our next picture is a picture of a Bible and some wedding rings. And this is basically to remind us once again that we need to be faithful in our marriage and that we need to be there for our spouse. The next one is a woman in a grocery store. She sees something that she likes, but she doesn't want to pay for it, which is not a good idea. That's called stealing, and God says, no, we're not supposed to do that either. Do not steal. All right, our next picture is, looks like someone got into some trouble, that they may have broken something, and they're trying to maybe point the blame on somebody else and say, I I, I didn't do that. 
And with this one, we're basically told, do not lie. God wants us to tell the truth all the time. And sometimes telling the truth can be hard. Sometimes we might have consequences for telling the truth. But you'll feel much better knowing that you didn't lie and that you told the truth. And the last one is a picture of basically someone has a really nice sports car. And there's some people looking at it and thinking, well, I just have a bike. I don't have a sports car. Sometimes people possess things or have things that we want or that we think that we should have. And God doesn't want us to be envious of others. He doesn't want us to be jealous or to think of them as having better things and us wanting to have those things. So if we think about it, the Ten Commandments are kind of like a mirror. They show us how bad we are and how we need to be clean before Jesus comes back to earth. God doesn't want us to be punished at the day of judgment, and that's why he gave us the Ten Commandments, to follow those rules to um, be obedient to him. We need to ask God for forgiveness any time we break any of those rules or those Ten Commandments, because sometimes that does happen. But he says, if you ask for my forgiveness, I will forgive you. If you obey his commands, God will never leave you. He will always be by your side. So he wants us to keep those Ten Commandments, and that way, if we do that, we will live a happy life. So as Pastor Jim talks today, he's going to talk about two of those commandments that are very important. And the first one, the first rule is love God with all your heart, your soul, and your might. And that means, once again, we need to put him first and love him more than anything else. The second rule is that we need to love others as much as we love ourselves. So that means you need to be kind and nice to everybody. And sometimes that can be hard because they're not always kind and nice back to you. But you always need to make sure that you are treating them and loving them just like God loves us. So both of these rules, they contain that one big word, which is love. And we do that once again because God is love. So I have a little prop up here. What do you see when you look in there? You see yourself? Okay. Does everyone see themselves in the mirror? Yeah? How about over here? Do you guys see anything other than yourselves? No? Okay. I'm looking. I don't see anything else either. But when you look in the mirror, something that you can remember is that we are created in God's image. So God is in every one of you. So we, when we think about that, that's how we can determine that we want to make good decisions and we want to do good things to honor him. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear God, have mercy on us according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out our wrongdoings and wash away all of our wickedness and cleanse us from our sins. Help us to show you every day how much we love you and help us to love others as much as you love them. In your name we pray. Amen. It was a warm September evening. My best friend Jeff Sandberg and our fellow staff person Colleen were sitting in Jeff's apartment working on door signs my sophomore year in college. I was resident assistant of Hawthorne Hall at Southern Oregon State College. Jeff, being a Garfield fan, had created a hundred eight and a half by eleven gold and black Garfield signs to which we were writing the names of each student living in our dorm to put up on their doors to welcome them. We spent the whole evening cross legged on just floor made editorial comments about some of the interesting names that we came across. I remember vividly doing the door signs for the third floor since none of the staff members lived up there. And I said, here we go. Jamie, J-A-M-I, Funk, his roommate with Lisa, Goatee, funk and goatee. <laughs> Proof that there's humor in the housing department. 
Fast forward a couple of months. I and my good friend Tom Russell are playing chess and watching Monty Python in my dorm room. I've beaten him severely at chess for the umpteenth time, and we're becoming sufficiently bored with Monty Python being able to recite nearly every line. Way too early in the day to be this bored. So I call up that very same Jamie Funk and say, hey, Tom and I are bored. How about you bring your roommate, Rana? We'll buy dinner and take you to the movie and not be bored anymore. They agreed. They came and picked us up. We went to a non-existent taco shop that doesn't exist today and saw Beverly Hills Cop, too. When the girl showed up the dorm room, Jamie was driving. Rana got in the back seat. I, having started all this, got in the front seat. And Tom got in the back seat. Today, Jamie and I have been married going on 28 years. Tom and Rana are celebrating their nearly 20th anniversary next year. There's a fine, fine thread that runs through our lives takes us from place to place. If you don't believe me, let me demonstrate it. You get that in. Hold it nice and tight. Mel Krill, stand up. Ah. Get my pitching arm ready. Watch out in between. <laughs> just in case, just get back to Mel. Here we go. Oh! <laughs> you didn't catch it. <laughs> back to Mel. All right, Mel. Here's the rules of the game. You gotta pick a card. You gotta throw it to somebody who's identified on that card. But you gotta be able to say their name, too. So you may have to, you know, ask. Just in case. Okay. Pick a card, any card. Any card, okay. All right, what does it say? Someone who was at the last Wednesday morning men's breakfast. So Bible study. last Wednesday morning's Bible study. Who, who all was there? Well, Come on, I know a few of you had well, to be I there. I'm trying to find them. Yeah, they, they, there you go. Yeah. Cute. Okay, so you pick one of them. You got to throw them the yard. You got to hang yeah, on to I, that end I of it. I don't have a very good hand. I'll just throw that one there. Who's it, who, okay, you're going to throw it to David. Yeah. You didn't say his name. You know David, right? right? Okay, you can sit down again. All right, David, you got to stand up. <laughs> You can sit down now, but hang on to your piece of the thread. Do you let go of your thread? Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> breaking the rules of the game. Okay. Don't do that. Here we go. Okay, pick a card. Once you have it, you can sit down. You don't have to. All right, what does it say? Someone who is 25 years different in age than you. Okay, so let's see. That would be 100 and... Um, now let's go uh, the other uh, way. Let's go the other way. Pretty close. So, so minus 25 would be what? About 50. Okay. Who's, who's about 50? Come on. We got a few people. Susie's up there. Who else? Oh, you got you to pick. Oh, there's someone back here. So, so who do you want to throw it to? I know that Tom's more than 50. Yeah, but so that doesn't work. You got you got. You got to name one of these people who got their hand up. Scott? No, there's a couple of people with their hands up here. Oh, okay. There you go. I know. Who's he? Mr. Pepin. All right. Throw it over there to him. There we go. Okay, I'll take the card back. I want that. All right. 
DJ Scott, stand up. Okay, you pick one now. Okay, what's it say? Haven't had to throw it far yet. Someone four pews behind or in front on the other side of the aisle. Okay, so uh, one, two, three, four. You got two choices there, or one, two, three, four. You got one choice there. Who are you going to throw it to? I'll go back corner here. Who, who's that? You got me. You got me? <laughs> hey, you got me. <laughs> Better ask him his name. You got to know who you're throwing it to. What's your name? Matt. Matt, there you go. It's Matt. Hey, there we go. Nice throw, nice catch. All right. Not using that one. Okay, pick another card. Okay, what does that say? Someone who has their 445 breakthrough prayer card with them. Oh! Ooh, test. Who's got their breakthrough card with them? Oh, we got a few people holding their hands up. Look at that. Who are you going to throw it to? I think I'm going to go right next door to me here. Okay, who's that? Trina. Okay. <laughs> You got to hold on to your part there, though. You can't lose track there. Okay. Trina, you got to pick a card now. Okay. Oh, someone who has been a liturgist. Ooh, someone who's been a liturgist. <laughs> Alyssa, okay. Oh, yeah. Wow. I'm going to get on the other side. Watch out in here. Get ready. Catch the ball. Pass it forward. Here we go. Yep. Hey. Woo. All right, Alyssa. We're down to four. Okay. A volunteer for a route to God. R2. Okay. Who's a volunteer for a route to God? Diane. Uh, who? Diane. Diane. All right. There you go. You got to keep your end of the string. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. How are we doing? Good. Okay. You got three. Okay. Um, someone who was baptized in this church. All right. Oh, you got people oh, back there. You got a couple. So oh, yay. All right. Trey Theobald. Don't lose track of that. You got to hang on there. All right. Okay, Trey, let's see. Someone who's baptized in this church. Oh, no, we already did that one. <laughs> Pick one of those. Uh, a member of the confirmation class. Ooh, a member of the confirmation class. Uh-oh. Not a lot of them here today. Stand up. Who, who we got? Raise your hands. There's a couple. Who are you going to throw it to? Uh, <laughs> Raya. Raya? Okay, Raya, stand up. Give him a target. Get ready back there. <laughs> oh, there you go. I'm having to duck, duck Corey. All right, Raya, you only got one left. Here you go. A mother who has a child under the age of 10. Okay, who are you going to throw it to? Oh, uh, she already got it. You can't, do, you can't use her. Who, who, who are you going to throw it to? Megan. Okay. All right, Megan, you're stuck with the ball of yarn. <laughs> you just can't keep it. There we go. Oh, I'll take that card, too. Where else did I leave cards? I left, I left, Mel still has a card. Let's have that one too. And, okay, there we go. Oh, I do actually, I have one more. Megan, you do get to throw one. I've got one more card. There you go. A member of the choir. A member of the choir. Oh, a member of the choir. <laughs> Karen, all the way up in the front corner. All right, get ready over there. Here it comes. <laughs> oh, 
oh, we got, we got a double pass. <laughs> hey. Over, under. All right. There we go. So, oh, okay, we can, we can leave that down there now. There. Okay. So we strung that all over the place. That was fun. Brian Huffman. How many people we got in church today? 120. I don't need this anymore either. I'll get rid of this. So, pull out my electronic brain. So we had 120, and we uh, passed it there 10 times, if you can believe it. So times 119 times 118 times 117 times 116 times 115, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, times 114 times 113 times 112 times 111 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 equals 4.211 to the 20th power 4 with 20 zeros I'm one of those real mathematician types what was that besides a big number we, we pass billions here, we into the trillions? Hmm? Yeah? Somewhere around, somewhere around four trillion different possibilities of who could have handled that ball of yarn. It's a pretty big number when you stop and think about it. But wait, there were some rules. See, the people who were at last Wednesday morning's Bible study, well, that wasn't 120. Seems to me I only saw about six hands, huh? So that's actually six times. And I got to admit, I had Mel's name picked out two weeks ago when I first figured I was doing this. Thank you for showing up. Marlon actually thanks you too because Marlon was my backup. So that's uh, times two because there were only two people selected there. Uh, someone, four pews in front or four pews in back. Well, there were only three. We counted that. Three. Um, mother of a child who was under 10. Well, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. Six, about seven of those here, times, okay, uh, someone who participated, was baptized in the class. Let's see, there were about ten. I think that was a pretty good sized number. We'll say that was ten, times uh, 25 years different. Well, we had only two people raise their hand for that one. Um... Someone who had their 440, I was impressed. There was a nice set of hands for that. We'll call it 12. 12. And uh, someone who's been liturgist. Um, well, geez, we only really had one name offered up for that. <laughs> but I know that there's about five or six of you here, so we'll say that. And uh, R2G volunteers. Well, you've got maybe... Half dozen, nine of them that are here probably today. That sound fair? Yeah, okay. So we went from four trillion possibilities to three thousand two hundred. Oh no, three only three million possibilities. Three million from four trillion. Uh, we lost one, two, three, four, five, six. We lost fourteen zeros. So trillion would be small too I think 14 zeros with those rules that we put see that's the thing about rules rules exclude people anytime we make rules and laws we're excluding people 
How about everyone stand up for a moment? Let's actually figure this out. If you have been a volunteer for R2G, sit down. If you have been a liturgist, sit down. If you have your 445 prayer card with you, sit down. That one doesn't. Uh, uh, let's see. Susie's sitting down. EJ, you get to sit down. You were 25 years different from our. Okay. If you were baptized in this church, sit down. If you're the mother of a child under the age of 10, sit down. Let's see. Um, Betty, you get to sit down, and Matt's already sitting down. Betty, you get to sit down. There you go. Uh, the guys who are at the last Wednesday morning prayer breakfast get to sit down. Members of the confirmation class get to sit down. Members of the choir get to sit down. If you're standing up, you were excluded from this little game. It wasn't intentional. These are just the quick rules that I came up with. But it points out what we do when we make rules and laws. We leave people out. You can all sit down. Truth is, the Bible has 613 laws. 613 rules and laws that govern the Jewish people. Ten of those are the Ten Commandments that we heard described already for us this day. Written by the hand of God. Many scholars would point that of the 603 that remain, some very well could be brought to us by the hand of God, and others certainly could have been more about the different nuances to interpreting laws that already existed. Regardless, 613 is a goodly sum number to try and keep track of. And they dictate who you can marry, who you can sacrifice for, who is clean and unclean, who can pray in the temple, on what days you can pray, who are the sick, and who can be around them. And each one of them excludes groups of people. In our reading today, Jesus tells us there are two laws, two commandments. Love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. In these two commandments reside all the law. This is what is needful. Let me tell you something else about human nature. The opposite of faith is fear. And what we fear most is the unknown. So to quell our fear inside of us, that's what we do. We don't turn to our faith. We instead turn to laws. We're afraid for our children as they go to school. So we make speed zones around schools. We put red flashing lights on buses and we write laws 
to enforce them. We're afraid of people breaking into our homes, stealing what is ours. So we set the penalties high. We make places to sever those people off from society called prisons. We back them up with third strike laws to increase the harshness of those sentences. We want to protect jobs and entitlements, and we fear what foreigners will do. So we build walls and fences, threaten extradition and deportation, and strengthen limitations on who can enter our borders. Jesus gives us two laws, two commandments. Love your God, love your neighbor as yourself. And if we read all the different stories where he tells us those two commandments, we find one of them is the preamble to the parable of the Good Samaritan. I don't need to tell you that story again. You all know it by heart. But at the end of the story, at the conclusion, where Jesus is explaining who is your neighbor, the Samaritan that he points out is so despised in Jewish culture that when he asks the question, Who is neighbor to the man? The Jew can't even say the name. The one who helped. How would things look differently? How would our laws look? we truly put them through the lens of what Jesus has told us to do. You see, we bind ourselves up in legalisms and commandments and laws and rules. And Jesus only gives us two. And not only is that freeing and only having to remember two basic rules, but it's freeing in opening up to everyone who is invited to participate. Here's what's most important. Because we like to find different things to describe what it is we're afraid of. We do that to mask the truth. What is it we're really afraid of? It's not the unknown. It's really only one thing. Death. We cannot control it. So we fear it. And yet, the ultimate faith we have in Christ is salvation and eternal life. If fear is not faith, we are called to be a faithful people. And hold and show that promise of salvation and eternal life in everything we do. Because if we have true obedience in Christ, that's what it means to have faith. And if we have that faith, then we have freedom from all the things we fear most. Most importantly, the fear of death. Obedience is freedom. Amen.